Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us on the call today. Uh, I'm Karen with the marketing team at Raza and I'm joined by Alan Nickel, our co-founder and CTO. So we'll be spending the next 45 minutes talking about conversation driven development and the six steps that make up CDD. And Alan's going to tell you a lot more about that in a moment. Uh, we've got a lot of exciting content to cover, but before we begin, I wanted to quickly go over the agenda and how to participate during today's webinar. We'll start with a little bit of background about Raza, and then we will dive into conversation-driven development. Um, but this isn't just theoretical. We'll talk about how you can put CDD into practice with your AI assistant today. And then we'll save some time at the end for Q&A. And a few housekeeping notes. So you'll notice that you're mute, muted. Uh, please go ahead and keep your mic muted during the webinar. Um, but do ask questions in the Zoom chat. We'll be gathering questions for the Q&A portion throughout the webinar. So please go ahead and ask your question at any time. Uh, we'll add it to the list and then we'll ask your question on air at the end. And last but not least, we are recording the webinar and we'll upload it to YouTube in a few days as soon as we get it edited. So we'll email you a link to that recording after the webinar, uh, along with a short survey. Uh, and with that, Alan, I will hand things over to you. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, great. So thanks everyone for joining. Um, and I wanted to start with a quiz <laughs> uh, so we can gauge where everyone is. So if you type this URL into your browser, um, it will take you, you know, 20 seconds to do the quiz. Um, if you're feeling brave, uh, please post your score into the chat. Um, I'd love to see how people are doing. But the idea behind this is just to get a feeling for, you know, to what extent you're all already practicing CDD. Um, and if any of the questions don't make sense to you, uh, don't worry too much about it. Um, hopefully it's all clear once we get to the end. So I'll just give everyone another 20 seconds or so to do the quiz and if you choose to, um, post your score in the chat. All right, well, it doesn't look like anybody's brave enough to share their score, but hopefully you had enough time to uh, complete the quiz. Oh, someone came in with 130 points. Incredible. Um, we got a 95, very respectable. Excellent. Okay, I'll just give everyone a few more seconds then since uh, we're getting different uh, people finishing up the quiz now. <laughs> This is really fun to watch. <laughs> Some familiar names coming here in the group chat. Welcome everyone, thanks for showing up. Um, so I'm sure a few more scores will trickle in, but I'll just get started then. Um, so yeah, thanks for playing along. I hope that was fun. Um, a great place to start. Looks like lots of people are already embracing parts of CDD, um, but there's also room to improve. So that's a great place to be for this webinar. Um, I mean, about Rasa, I'll cover this very quickly. Uh, you know, it's, um, it's probably a lot of you are already familiar with us. Um, we build the standard infrastructure for conversational AI. And we do that by doing three things. Um, of course, if you want to be the standard, you better be open source. Um, you know, the Rasa framework is open source. Uh, we invest very heavily in our community and make sure that people have, you know, the educational material they need and the tools they need to build great conversational AI. And we have a big research team and we work on a lot of applied research because this is very difficult and there are a lot of unsolved problems in this space. Um, and we have a huge community. It's really fantastic. Almost every single country in the world. Uh, we have developers building things with Rasa. Um, we have a you know, huge number of users on our forum. Uh, we have you know, companies in every kind of industry, uh, large companies using Rasa. That's fantastic. And thank you to everyone who uh, has contributed to the code base or created content or anything like that. And the way we think about uh, making progress on conversational AI is we introduced this idea of having five levels, uh, which we first introduced in 2018. 
Um, and just recently last month, uh, we published an update uh, at the L3 AI conference where we've you know, created the 2020 edition of the five levels of conversational AI. Um, and the key part of getting towards level five is being more and more accommodating of the way that users think about problems um, and lowering the burden on them to translate what they want into your language. So if you're interested in that, uh, there's a video on the Ranza YouTube channel. There's also a blog post on the Ranza blog. Um, but the kind of key connection between those two pieces is that conversation driven development or CDD is our thesis on how to get towards level five. And that's kind of this point here, how these two things connect. Um, the key idea to keep in mind about CDD is that if you have an assistant out there in production, you're already gathering all the information and all the data that you need to climb through level three, four, and five. And the key point is to listen, right? And so CDD or conversation driven development is the process of listening to your users and using those insights to drive the development of your AI system. So it's really just one idea and CDD is a framework for um, making use of that idea. Okay. Um, one step back, why do we need something like this? Um, so those of you who are in here, especially those of you with uh, high scores on the quiz, um, have clearly been building conversational AI for a while, right? And if you've been doing that, you know that it's very hard. And you also know that building that first prototype is not the hard part, right? That part's easy. The hard part is going from the initial prototype to something that's really great and you're you know, ready to ship and show to people. Um, and all the hard parts show up when you're trying to bridge that gap, right? And so I want CDD to serve two purposes. One is to help all of us build better conversational AI, but even more importantly, to save people who are new to the field from having, learning, having to learn that themselves, right? So we want to give new people a shortcut. And so CDD is made up of six actions and they're called share, review, annotate, test, track, and fix. And so what we'll do in this webinar is um, I'll introduce what each of them is and you know, what the motivation is behind them and what the lessons are behind them, um, and then show practically what those look like in a real development workflow. Okay, and the first one is share, and this one is super, super important. It's probably the most important one. Um, it doesn't matter what you're building, users will always surprise you with what you say. You cannot anticipate what users will say to your chatbot. Um, and so you should get some test users to try your prototype as early as possible, right? Um, way too many teams go off into the mountains for months at a time and then try and polish something and then they give it to users and it breaks. Of course it breaks, right? The only way to build good conversational AI is to build bad conversational AI and give it to people to break and improve from there, right? Um, there are no shortcuts, there are no exceptions. And the second one is to review. So spend time at every stage of the project, doesn't matter if you've been in production for a year or if you're just getting started, read the conversations that people have with your assistant, right? And spend time looking at it. The human brain is still the best pattern matcher and you, know, you can empathize, you can understand what is this user looking for, what are they wanting? Um, again, too many teams get caught up right away in trying to look at metrics, how many, how many times is this intent being predicted? Um, that's all good and that's useful, but it's not everything, right? And you're missing a huge amount of insight if you're not using your brain and looking at some of these conversations. And the next one is to annotate, right? Your model, your NLU model, is going to make predictions on real user messages that are getting sent in. So that's the data that it should be trained on as well, right? A uh, really common banana peel you see is that folks think they can you know, use a script or some kind of hack to generate a bunch of synthetic training data and that that's going to work well in production. It doesn't, right? The model needs to be trained on the same kind of data that it's going to be asked to make predictions on. Um, so use those messages as they come in, as people talk to your assistant, and annotate them and turn them into new training data. Uh, the fourth one is test, also something I care deeply about. Um, just because we're building something, you know, an AI assistant which has a machine learning component, doesn't mean that we're off the hook for, you know, using good software engineering practices, right? Um, professional teams don't ship software without tests. So the way we like to do it is to have end-to-end -end tests, right? So um, message in, message out, check that the whole conversation still works, whatever works for you. 
uh, but make sure that you have them, right? If you're working with a conversational AI platform that doesn't support creating tests and running tests, then what you have is a prototyping tool, right? That's, it's not fit for production if you can't run tests. Track, this is also a really key piece, right? Make sure that you have some way of measuring conversations that are going well and conversations that aren't going well and users that you're helping and users that you're not helping, right? Um, and quite often that's actually information that you need from the outside world, from outside of the conversation, right? Did this user end up converting? Or even did they not do something, right? Did this user talk to the customer service bot and then not get back in touch with customer support, right? It's, it's not perfect, but it's a decent proxy measure for saying we probably helped this person, right? And if that number is going down, then that's a good thing, right? Um, so find a way, it won't be perfect, but find some kind of proxy to measure conversations that are going well and that aren't because all the other effort that you're putting into proving your assistant, you wanna make sure that that correlates to your end users actually having a better experience and having been more successful. And then the final one is fix, uh, embrace it. Um, doesn't matter <laughs> uh, what you do, you will always, of course, encounter situations where your AI system fails, right? Um, so study those conversations, look at the ones that went smoothly, look at the ones that failed, right? They're usually unexpected situations. Um, if a conversation went perfectly, fantastic. Turn it into a test, right? Add it to your test cases. Um, if you find an issue, right, maybe you need to annotate some more data, maybe there's an issue with your code, with your API calls or something like that, um, but go and fix it and, you know, use the regular software development process, have an issue tracker, have a way of kind of prioritizing the conversations that come up. Cool. So that's the quick theoretical introduction to CDD. Uh, there are six actions. So I have two comments about CDD in practice, and then we'll switch to the um, demo. So the first comment about CDD is that it's not a linear process, right? It's not something that you just kind of follow a set of six steps and then you're done, right? You are gonna find yourself jumping between each of these things, and that's great, that's fantastic, that's the way it should be. The second is that it takes a mix of skills to practice CDD, right? There's, some of these actions require, you know, data science skills, machine learning skills, some of them are software engineering skills, right? If you've got to debug these API calls, um, some of them require a deep understanding of the domain and of the user and of the use case and what their expectations are, right? And rarely does one person have all of those skills, so it's usually a team effort. So think about the team that you have um, and the team that you need to practice CDD. Okay, so we're gonna go into the demo. Um, I'll show you some things that we've implemented to help people practice CDD. Um, using Raza X, but I think it's worth mentioning that CDD is completely independent of what tool you're using, right? It doesn't, it's just a, 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 an approach, it's a philosophy, and it doesn't, uh, it's not tied to a particular tool. Uh, we just build some things to help you do it. And so just to clarify for those who are maybe new to Raza or have used Raza Open Source, but not Raza X, um, Raza Open Source and Raza X work together. Um, it's not an either or situation, they're two separate products. Uh, Raza Open Source is the framework which you use to build AI systems, to train your model, run your model, etc. cetera. Um, and Raza X is a tool to help you practice conversation-driven development, right? So to look at what people are saying, uh, listen to your users, and use those conversations to improve um, your bot. Cool. Okay, so we're going to go on to the demo, um, and I'm still sharing my screen. So uh, you know, this part is quite techy, so if you're into demos and coding and all of that, um, you'll get a kick out of it. So the first thing we'll do is we'll run Raza X in local mode, um, which is really just about kind of getting those first CDD steps in as early as possible in your development process of your system, right? And then from there, we'll go on to, to server mode. Um, so if I'm in local mode, um, what I need to get started with CDD is of course the, the first version of my assistant. Right? I need something to get started with. It doesn't need to be sophisticated, but I need to have something. Um, and so I've uh, decided to start with one of our starter packs. So if you go to the docs, 
uh, on Raza. We have a couple of starter packs here that you can check out. Um, there's the financial services one, which is kind of a banking use case. Uh, you know, you can ask questions about, you can make transactions and check your balance and those kinds of things. Uh, and then there's the help desk assistant, um, which is like an IT help desk uh, kind of setup. It has a service now integration. Neither of these are intended to be a fully fledged bot or assistant that you would put in production, right? They're starting points. You can fork from there and go and develop your own thing. It's just enough that you can get started. Right? And so, um, I mean, this help desk one here, it's on GitHub. Uh, you can go and check it out. All the code is obviously open source. Um, and I've just cloned this repository here. Um, and that's this help desk assistant thing. So um, this is just a typical Raza project, right? You could also just type Raza in it um, and use the, the mood bot example that you start off with when you're a new Raza user. Um, but here we've got this help desk assistant running for us. Um, and so I've installed Raza X. You can install it via pip. Uh, the instructions are in the docs. Um, but to run it, you just move into the directory where your um, uh, where your assistant lives and type Raza X. And we'll give this a second to start up. Cool. Um, and so the kind of key thing that you want to be able to do in uh, local mode with Raza X is just get those first test conversations in with your users, right? And so, of course, you can go in here and talk to the bot yourself. You can, you can see which intents are being predicted, et cetera, um, kind of try it out in a nice UI. Um, but the really key piece is being able to share it with different folks, right? And so even before you have you know, a Slack integration set up or a Twilio number set up or like a Facebook Messenger webhook integrated or anything like that. You don't have to have anything. Uh, you just have the first basic assistant and you can share it with people, right? So you can go here um, and generate a link, right? Um, which you can then send to people uh, so that they can try it out. So um, I'll open this up in an incognito window. This is what the user experience looks like. Um, so here, you know, I don't get all this complexity of all the things we saw on the other screen. This is just a place where I can try out this assistant and see, you know, what can it do for me, right? Um, what's happening here. Um, and so there's one little caveat, which is that this link here is to localhost, which will only work on my machine, of course. Um, so we want to use something like ngrok. Um, if you're familiar with it, uh, oh, here we go. I have the command ready, ngrok. So this just creates a public URL, which forwards to my localhost port 5002. Um, and then I can actually just replace this here in the URL. And then um, this is a link that I could send to anyone in the world um, and they can go and have this conversation, right? Now, all these conversations will come up in Raza X here. Um, so it doesn't matter if, you know, I already have an integration with Facebook or something like that, or if I'm just talking to the bot myself, um, I see everything show up and I can start that process of review, right? So we've done the share step uh, and we can start to do the review step and we can start to do the annotation step. We can start to practice CDD. Uh, which I'll show you more of in just a second. Um, but this is just really the kind of basics in these very early versions of your bot where you're just doing the basic things, right? And so um, I'm using this in local mode, right? This is obviously not gonna be my production deployment, but I can already start to explore some of these, uh, some of this functionality, right? Um, so I can, you know, look through all the conversations and I can go and I can annotate all the messages, right? So we have this NLU inbox, which contains all the messages um, which aren't already part of the training data where Raz NLU had to make a prediction. Um, and I can either go and confirm these or you know, delete them or change the intent or mark them up um, and go and like add that to my training data, right? So I can already start to practice CDD locally even before I have um, a production assistant. Um, so those are kind of the first couple of steps of you know, share, review, and annotate, uh, which you can already start to practice uh, locally before you have a server set up. But then, you know, the real fun obviously comes in once we have a 
uh, Rouser X server. So that's the next piece that we're going to look at. So um, this Rouser X server that I'm showing you here is um, connected to the bot which lives on our documentation, which is called Sarah. Um, the code for that is also open source. It's a uh, uh, Rouser demo um, in our GitHub org. Um, and so if you're going in our documentation and you're talking to this bot, you'll get to talk to this one and you can check out all the code in here and how it all works. Um, and we can go and review those conversations in here and see how people are doing, right? Um, so the homepage of uh, the Rouser X <laughs> product is the conversation screen and that's to encourage you to review conversations, right? So here we have um, conversations coming in from different channels. Socket.io is the one that connects to our website, to the little chat widget. Um, and, uh, but of course, like if I have test users, they'll show up here. If I also have Facebook connected, they all show up here. Right? Um, and of course, here I now have a much larger number of conversations, right? Lots of people talk to this assistant all the time. And so the question is, how do I review conversations in a way that actually scales? Right? Um, and so we give you a kind of Swiss army knife of filters that you can use to dive down into which are the conversations that are really relevant and interesting for you, right? Um, so let's have a look. Um, so we can have a look at maybe, so quite a few people will just open up the chat, say hi, and then kind of abandon it. So one of the things that I like to filter for is, you know, a certain number of user messages, maybe five or something like that. Um, and give it a second. This should take a chunk out of the blurry filter. Yeah. Um, or I can look for particular intents, you know, that are being expressed, right? That I want to know because I want to know if they're going well or if they're not going well. Uh, actions, specific channels, entity slots, uh, confidence of the NLU predictions, uh, which can be a very, uh, and the confidence of the Rouser core predictions as well, which can be very helpful for you know, spotting errors, I can look for the fallback action, all sorts of things, right? And I can slice and dice all these conversations and start to look at the relevant ones, right? Rather than looking at every single one. Um, so that's the kind of review step. And then we have some quick actions here. So you can mark conversations as reviewed, you can save them for later, uh, you can filter by that status as well. Um, and you can add tags, right? If you wanna keep track of things. Um, and so that's a key part. So if we say, you know, we have um, share, review, annotate, right? You've seen those parts. Um, and now we have test, track, and fix, right? And so in the tests, uh, we have our tests set up on a CI CD server, right? So we're using GitHub Actions uh, for the Rouser demo. So if I look at the pull requests, if I look at some that were recently merged, um, if I go and check, or for example, this one, um, and I look at all the checks that were run. Oh, not that one. This one. Um, yeah, so we do a whole bunch of things, right? So we check, um, we run the Rouser data validate command to make sure that that all works as correct uh, as expected, right? So we, we don't have any clashes in our training data. Uh, we run through a bunch of test stories. So we train a model, run a bunch of test stories. We do a cross validation of the NLU model. So we check that, you know, uh, how the model is performing. Um, and then we actually post those in a comment to the uh, pull request. And then we have a continuous deployment step where, you know, if the model's good, we push it out to the server and then it's updated in real time. Um, so if I go back and I look at that pull request, so firstly, I can see that all my tests have passed, right? So I get a lot of green checks. Um, and actually I get a comment on the pull request which tells me how all my different intents are performing, right? So what's the overall F1 score for all my intents? Um, you know, which ones are doing well, which ones are not, and what are they most likely to be confused with? Um, and the same for the entities, right? What's the precision of recall for all of the different entities that I have? Um, so I can check that and, you know, like any other piece of software, check that when I'm annotating things, when I'm improving things, that they're not getting worse, right? And so if I'm, uh, working through my NLU inbox here, and I'm annotating uh, some you know, new examples here. I want to use Rasa on my website. Okay, FAQ, wonderful. Um, 
I'm told here that I have changes, I can push them to Git, and then they show up in a new uh, pull request, and I can check that my changes actually improve the system before I merge, right? Um, so that's the testing step, right? Testing CI CD, same as any other piece of software development. Um, and then tracking and fixing. So we have track. Um, so if we go back to the conversations view, um, if you look, some of these conversations have labels, right? And these labels can either be added um, manually here, right, by adding labels, but you can also use the API to add these tags. And so when we talk about bringing external information in, right, that's a really key piece. So if I know that my user has either given positive feedback or they've converted, you know, they've, they've upgraded to a premium or they haven't gotten back in touch or something has happened in the outside world, which I want to bring back into Raza X, I can make an API call and that tags that conversation with this tag and then I can filter by those conversations, right? So I can track how many people are in fact, um, you know, converting or having successful interaction over time. Um, and then the final step is to fix, uh, very simple and straightforward, um, just a nice little feature that each conversation has a, a unique URL, which means that if you create a GitHub issue, you can paste this URL in there and then people can go and see um, exactly the conversation you were looking at. In fact, you can select a specific message uh, and each message actually has its own URL. So you can point people to exactly the thing you were looking at and say, hey, what was, what was going on here? And you can use your typical issue tracking tool to, uh, to go and smash out all of those bugs. Cool, so that's obviously once you have, you know, uh, your assistants ready to give to users, you deploy it to a server, you can do that with the one line deploy script, which you can find in the Raza X docs, it's really easy to set up. Um, and then you have a sort of full production grade server, which you can hook up to as many channels as you want, to your website, to Facebook, to Slack, um, and go and review all those conversations and practice CDD. Um, so yeah, that's it for the demo. So I think we're gonna go on to Q and A, um, Karen. Awesome, thank you, Alan. Uh, thanks to everyone that submitted your questions. So let's go through those. Um, our first one is from Yassine, um, who noted, uh, is reading reviews just available for Raza X and not Raza? Maybe there's something we could clarify there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Um, I mean, of course, if you like, <laughs> uh, you can look at your tracker store. If you're just using Raza open source, um, and, uh, and try and review conversations in there, right? But Raza X gives you an nice UI, you can see all the conversations in there, and uh, you know, it's obviously much more pleasant to read than trying to read through logs. So um, it's not theoretically impossible, but it's obviously much nicer if you're using Raza X. And it's free, so you might as well. Nice. Uh, next question is from Andy, who noticed that in the demo, you filtered for a minimum of five messages. Um, but the question is, wouldn't filtering for below five actually tell you more about why users abandoned ship, you know, because they had a frustrating experience or something was unhelpful? It's a very good point. Um, it's a cool feature request. Um, I'll add it to the backlog for sure. Nice. Um, and then our next question is from Will. Um, are there any plans to add a filter for the user ID? Oh, um, well, you can filter by user ID by just attaching it to the URL. So the, oh, I still, I'm still sharing my screen, right? Um, so here in the URL, this is just the user ID. So if you just type it in, you should find the one that you're looking for. I presume that solves the, the use case that you're describing. Nice. Um, and then our next question is from Joan. Um, so is semantic clustering used in any of the filters or is it most often by confidence scores and intents? Uh, it's a great question. So we have um, so far in, uh, you know, the latest version of Raza X, which is out, which is uh, 0.31. It's, you know, sort of confidence, specific intents, actions, length, all that. Um, a really exciting new filter that's coming out in the next release is actually being able to filter by conversations which have a novel conversation turn that you haven't seen before. So something that isn't in your training data, a user did something that you hadn't expected, they said something in a place you hadn't seen them say that before. Um, and you can specifically filter by conversations that contain novel turns, which is obviously a very powerful filter to um, understand things that are, you know, wh where you don't have coverage in your training data. 
Very cool. Um, and then our next question is from uh, Vibob. Vibob. Um, and the question is, can you search on the tags later once you create them? Uh, you can filter by the tags for sure. Uh, so let's have a look at the tag filtering experience. Uh, so we can go tags here. Yeah, so you can search through uh, if you have a big list of tags like we have here. <laughs> um, but then yes, of course, you can, you can very much filter conversations by uh, which tags are there. So in this case, uh, if you've ever talked to Sarah, if you ask a technical question and the bot doesn't know the answer, um, it will try searching the documentation for you. Um, and then if, and then it will ask if you found an answer there in the documentation. And if you didn't, then the conversation gets tagged with this doc search unhelpful thing. Um, and, uh, and you can sort of filter by those to see where did users not get a good answer to their uh, question. Perfect. Um, and then the next question is from uh, Vaishnavi, and this might be uh, maybe tied back to the user ID, um, mm -hmm. but they ask, how do we know which user is having the conversation? Mm. Um, well, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so, I mean, from Raza's perspective, right, Raza gets a conversation ID, right, uh, which is, you know, depending on uh, I mean, in this case, it's on the website. So these are sort of randomly generated for a user. We don't know who that user is. Um, if you're in uh, on Facebook or Slack, then that user ID will be something that you can tie back to a specific user, right? And you can certainly do that, but Raza doesn't do that for you, right? So you'll have to um, fill that somehow uh, in there. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and then Cooper asks, is the team working on additional starter packs for different verticals? Definitely. Um, I definitely wanted to do way more starter packs. And if you have suggestions for ones you'd like to see, uh, please create an issue either in the Raza repo. Yeah, actually just in the Raza repo um, with ideas for new starter packs. I would love to hear them. Great. Uh, another question from Vaishnavi. Uh, how many users can Raza handle at once? Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, like any of these questions, obviously the answer is, uh, it depends. Um, you can scale up a, so when you deploy Raza X uh, with the one line deploy script, you deploy it on a, a tiny Kubernetes cluster, but you can also use the one line deploy script with a, with a full sort of Kubernetes as a service, you know, uh, on Google Cloud or AWS or something like that. Um, and you can scale up the number of Raza servers which are actually handling users simultaneously, right? And so the total, the, the total limit is, of course, how many users can you handle simultaneously? Um, you know, with, let's say, like two to three Raza open source containers on reasonable hardware, like with, with you know, a CPU or two each, um, you can already handle a lot of traffic. Um, of course, it depends a little bit on, you know, the NLU pipeline components that you're using. Oftentimes a big bottleneck is if you have custom actions that are very slow and um, kind of waiting for those to return can be a, a, a bit of a hassle. But um, there's no sort of obvious straight answer, but you have to run at a really big scale uh, before like two or three Raza open source containers can no longer handle your load. Awesome. Um, okay, our next question is from Jonathan. So test results seem to be at a summary level. So for example, an intent might have 90% accuracy. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to identify specific messages that you want to track or need to pass? Um, so it isn't yeah. necessarily meaningful if an intent has 90% accuracy, if the 10% that fail are the most common messages. 100% agree. Um, and so that's, of course, the beauty of open source. So the way that we've set up um, the CI, the GitHub action for Raza, uh, for, for the Sarah demo bot, and that's just what we check and we just print the summary statistics. But what the GitHub action does is it actually just runs the Raza test command, which does all of this and, you know, usually prints the output to the console and writes it to some files. Um, and specifically, um, it writes an output file with all the mistakes that the model made okay, during the testing. And so you can add, you know, literally one more line in your CI, you know, doing a, a regex search in that file, checking that there's nothing in there uh, that you really, really need to pass. Um, and so that's definitely something that you can customize if that's what's important to you, which makes perfect sense, right? If the, 
the bot gets 99% actually, but it doesn't understand hello, then that's uh, not great. Awesome. Um, and that's a really good segue into our next question, which is from Sanjay. Um, so is there an option or maybe planning for in the future with GitHub merge where below a certain intent accuracy, like let's say 20%, uh, the PR check fails automatically? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, that, let's see. Um, so, it, so one of the tests that is run in CI is we run through the test stories, right? And there, um, the browser test command has a fail on errors flag. And if you add that fail, like minus minus fail on errors, then if any of the test stories fail, uh, the CI check fails. Uh, we don't yet have a feature for failing, you know, based on some heuristic of how much you want to pass, but that's a really cool idea for a feature request, right? So you could either um, hack that into the script yourself or just add it as a post-processing step to check that score, you know, write that score to a file, check that it's, um, you know, uh, higher than a certain number. And if not, then you can, uh, you know, fail the build. It's a cool suggestion. Nice. Um, we have another question from Yasin. Um, so how would you recommend deleting the history of a chatbot? So in this case, Yasin has a course that's deployed to Udemy. Um, mm -hmm. And it has more than 10,000 students, which is very cool. Um, mm -hmm. And the students who are using the chatbot sometimes ask why the session is stuck. So he's already set session persistence to false on socket IO. Um, but maybe is there something else that you would recommend checking there? Um, so my guess is that the chatbot is sitting on a website and it's using socket IO and um, it's persisting that user ID across sessions and it's saving it in a cookie. And so when the user comes back, it's still the same conversation, even if the session expired. So the easiest thing to do is to actually just generate a new user ID every time the user logs in. So you can either, um, I'm sure that in the web chat component, you can turn off the use of that cookie so that every time the user comes back, they generate a fresh ID and they have a brand new conversation. That's probably the easiest way to do it. Uh, okay. Sorry, sorry, can I? Can I have uh, a clarification about this uh, one? I, I'm Yasin. I am who, the, who asked for this question. But uh, as you said, I can't uh, cre uh, create these users. I, okay, uh, as uh, Karen said, uh, in the session persistence, I set false for the sockets IO. And the problem is, for example, if I am from one browser, I'm uh, sending a message. In the other browser, getting the same message, and so it's persists the, the same problem. I have the same messages. This is what I didn't understand. I tried to to publish this in the forum, but until now I didn't get the the, the answer. Sorry for the interruption. Um, okay, I'll take I'll take this answer, but um, please everyone keep yourself muted. Um, I'm not sure that I fully understood what's going wrong. It sounds like what you're saying is that you have a user in two different browsers who's getting the same answer. Um, I would suggest, please just, uh, you can tag me in the forum, tag me in your question, and I'll gladly take a look. Okay, cool. thank you so much. Yeah, it sounds like that one might need a little more uh, time offline. Um, so I think we've got time for uh, maybe just one or two more. Um, our next question is from Ruben. Uh, how does the recently released GPT-3 affect Raza's development? Yeah, um, it's a great question. And uh, we've been playing around with it. It's very fun, uh, lots of interesting things. I think uh, we still don't know all the things that it can do. Um, personally, I certainly wouldn't just put GPT-3 generated output and send it to my users. Um, and if you go on the Raza blog, uh, you can check out a recent blog post by Vincent, a research advocate who's been playing with it and exploring. Um, things you can do, interesting things you can do with GPT-3 as it relates to conversational AI. Um, I would say it's first impressions so far, um, but it's an exciting development um, for sure. Cool. And uh, I think this will probably be our last question because, Alan, I know that you had some other resources that you wanted to share at the end. Yeah. Uh, but I think this is a good one to end on. So this is from Vlad. Um, and... Yeah, this is a little subjective. So in your personal opinion, uh, what's still currently missing in conversational AI technology? So not really specifically about Raza, 
um, but really across the broader industry, all of the companies and researchers that are working on this problem. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously this is something I think about all the time. Uh, I'd say the biggest one, the drum I've been beating for uh, the last six months or so is that we have to break free from this idea of intent and having intents for every single message. Um, so if you Google, like, we have to get rid of intents, there's a blog post that I published last uh, end of last year. Um, and I think that's one of the really big bottlenecks, right? So long as we're limiting ourselves to saying that every single user message has to fit into one of these categories, uh, we're never going to get to true level three or, or beyond conversational AI. So I think that's the one of the biggest things we have to get rid of. Yes. And uh, Alan, do you want to say a few words to send us out? Yes, of course. Um, so quick recap. Um, I mean, just going back to the motivation, right? Why do we need an idea like a CDD? Um, it's an acknowledgement that conversational AI is hard and it's not going to magically solve itself. Um, and I think for those of us who are experienced, we owe it to folks who are new to the community to give them a shortcut, right? That they don't have to bang their heads against the same problems, uh, but they can sort of go further than we did and we can all make progress as a community together. Um, and so just an invitation to join the conversation uh, in different ways, uh, share the knowledge you have, especially those of you who crushed the quiz, um, help other teams move faster. Um, just a few initiatives we've just been starting around getting a conversation going around CDD. Um, you can add a tag to your GitHub repo. Uh, there's now a conversation-driven development tag, and then anyone who goes and checks out that tag uh, can see your repo in that list. Um, so you can kind of compare and see what other people are doing. Uh, there's a LinkedIn group that I would invite everybody to join. Uh, it's called Conversation Driven Development. It should be easy to find. Uh, some great conversations have been starting in there. Um, and if you enjoyed the quiz, and I hope you did, uh, share it with your friends. You know, it might start an interesting, interesting conversation about um, how you as a team are, are building your assistance. Um, and the URL is easy to remember, but I've got it in here in any case. Um, and, you know, as I said with all of this, if you disagree, if you have thoughts, please email me. I'd love to hear about it. Um, start the conversation and thanks for joining today.